Well, amen. I think we should just pray and go home after that. Right. Goodness. Well, that was great. Thank you so much, Lindsay, and uh, for everyone else who brought the music this morning. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, and today we'll be looking at verses 10 through 14. And the title of the message is Learning to Be Content. As you're turning, there was a story I ran across that speaks of a pilot. It says, the story is as follows about a pilot who, all, pilot who always looked down on a certain valley when, the, when his plane passed over it. One day, his co-pilot asked him, what's so interesting about that spot? The pilot replied, you see that stream over there? Well, when I was a kid, I used to sit down there and fish. And every time a, fl- a airplane flew over, I would look up and wish I were flying. Now things have changed. Now I look down and wish I were fishing. <laughs> the story basically is a little bit humorous, but it reminds us of a pretty obvious lesson, isn't it? We have a really hard time with ever being content in life, don't we? I like to think of it this way. If you have A, you won't B. If you have B, you won't A. And you can put A and B anywhere and fill in the blank anywhere along the way. And that is actually the way we typically are, isn't it? Not all the time, but we tend to have trouble with being content. Well, this morning we're going to continue our study in Philippians. And today, as we continue, we're in the latter section of the letter. Uh, You can rejoice next week. Will Lord willing be done? Uh, If you've not enjoyed the the sermon, you're ready for us to move on. But uh, today we're going to continue. But Paul, in this latter part uh, of Philippians, he is giving various practical instructions. But today we're going to focus on the one he gives, which is contentment. We're going to look at finding the source of contentment. Now, before we go any further, I want to remind you, Paul is in prison And he's waiting to appear. He has appealed to appear before Caesar. And yet he's going to give us an example of contentment. Now, isn't that the ultimate reversal of fortunes? Because if you and I were in prison, let me ask you, would you be saying, here is an example of me being content in prison? Just remember where Paul is as we go through this today. Now, the outline you'll find also on the back of the bulletin. So if you have the bulletin, you can use that. It's the exact same one. But what we'll be looking at this morning is verse 10 of Philippians 4, thankful for their gift. Paul begins with being thankful for their gift. In verses 11 through 12, Paul's contentment is in every circumstance, though. And then finally, we'll see in verses 13 through 14, essentially this. The source of contentment wasn't their gift. It was something else. And that's what we're going to look at today. What is the key to contentment even in chains in prison? Let's read again Philippians verse, uh, chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 10 through 14. So follow along with me if you brought your Bibles. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked an opportunity. Not that I speak from want. I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of abundance and of suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. Now, I've been looking at different pictures along the way, and today we're going to look at this one. I had shown a while back a picture of the river in which it is typically seen as the site or the traditional site of uh, uh, Lydia's um, Baptism, but you'll notice in this particular one, this one actually zeroes in on a particular location. So, if you notice the little white uh, 
structure there, that's generally, if you were to go visit there, that would be where they specifically take you along the river. If you want to read about what this is, this is Acts 16, 14 through 15. So again, it just kind of gives you an idea. Again, this is a real place, a real church, a real people came to the saving knowledge of the truth and so forth. But uh, that would be the place in which they came. And uh, that is typically Lydia's baptismal site. Now, we've been covering this letter for many weeks now, and you probably know chapter 1 is joy in seeing the Lord in our circumstances. I liken it to Romans 8, 28, that God can do all things, right? And He can work things in all the situations in life, and He can bring good in them and out of them. And so the first thing in chapter 1 is that we see the Lord working in circumstances all the circumstances in life. So in other words, if you have a bad situation and you see the Lord working in that, uh, you can rejoice. You also, in chapter 2, we see that there is joy in serving the Lord, but there is the caveat to it. And that caveat is humility. It's Christ-like service. We get the example of Jesus along with, of course, Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus. But then in chapter 3, Paul changes a little bit and warns them about legalism because there were a lot of individuals, Judaizers, that said, look, you can come to faith in Jesus Christ, but you also have to be baptized in order to receive eternal life. And Paul wants them to avoid legalism, and they can have joy by growing in Christ-likeness, follow good examples, and then they need to be reminded that they are citizens of where? Heaven from whom they wait the appearing of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we move into chapter 4, what you have is there is joy in seeing, basically, that the Lord gives provisions for the believer. Some of those provisions we've seen, harmony, peace, help with anxiety, today contentment. The last one is that the Lord provides for our needs. I used this before. I cannot remember who said this, but He provides for our needs, not our greeds. Okay? And that's what the Lord is doing there, and we'll see that next week. The Lord is the provider. So if you were here with us last week, it's pretty easy to remember that we need to learn to live in harmony. There was the two ladies, and they weren't getting along within the church. And what does Paul say? You need to have the mind of Christ and get over yourselves and get along. Uh, because if they don't, of course, there is, not, there is a lack of harmony in the church, and the church is not as effective. You have peace of God, but there is the thing that comes before peace of God, and that's peace with God, Romans 5.1. If you are here today and you are still looking to have peace with God, that is only through the cross by faith in Christ alone. And that is how we have that. But then Paul also deals with the mind. How many of us have left church and then during the week Satan starts messing with the mind? One of the ways he does that, I think, today is through social media and various types of things like that. And he begins to mess with the mind. And Paul says we need to have control over our thinking and how do we do that? Well, we think on things that are true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, of good repute. How many of us have done that this week? And then how many of us haven't done that this week? And then we think, oh, heavens to Betsy, I don't know why my mind's so messed up. I mean, I've saturated it and filled it with garbage. I'm not sure why nothing good is coming out of my mind. So that is sort of the idea. But this week, we're going to begin looking at verse 10. And Paul says he's thankful for the gift that they have given them. He expounds on this more next week. But I want to remind you again, Paul is in prison. He's awaiting to appear before Caesar. And he is joyful. Content is the key for this week. Notice what he says in verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Paul begins to have in this letter in chapter 3 where it's not simply rejoicing, but he rejoices in the Lord. His joy is found in Christ Jesus. That is the center, that is the beginning point of all source of joy. But you'll notice that he, he includes the Greek greatly. Paul didn't just simply rejoice in the Lord at what they had done, but he had great joy joy in seeing what they had done. And you'll see a little bit of it this week, and next week we'll see even more of it. 
But one of the things to remember is that they had a long history of helping Paul, this church. Uh, and we're going to look at a few of these, but I want you to look over, and this will be more for next week, but look in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 4, the same one we're, that we're in. Paul says in verse 15, You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, he's referring here to Acts 16, when they went there, established the church, he says, After I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica you sent a gift more than once for my, notice, needs. So what happens is that Paul goes in Acts chapter 16 to Philippi. His next stopping point is Thessalonica, or Thessaloniki as they call it today. But when Paul was in Thessalonica, they gave gifts to him on varied occasions. So we know he was there for at, length, at least a lengthy period of time. So Paul here is saying, look, even when I left in Acts chapter 6, 17, you gave towards my needs. These aren't Paul getting, this isn't Paul getting an iPhone in the mail. This isn't Paul getting a new iPad. I know those are essentials for today, right? I mean, the whole world would stop spinning if we didn't have them. But Paul says again, needs. But I want you to look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 in verses 1 and 5, 1 through 5. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. Paul speaks of great generosity among the Macedonian churches. Again, it behooves us to study these things and read it with Western eyes. Paul is speaking here of those churches that are in Macedonia. This is the Europe, if you will, in that period of time. That sort of Asia Minor and all of those sorts of areas. So here Paul speaks of in 2 Corinthians 8. And we're just going to read verses 1 through 5. You get an idea that there were churches there which would have included Philippi that gave towards Paul, and Paul was appreciative of their generosity. So let's read 2 Corinthians 8. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. So this would include one of the, uh, this would include Philippi. Verse 2, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy in their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. So they were impoverished, but they gave out of that impoverished state. Does that make sense? In other words, these weren't people with great masses amount of wealth, but they gave as well. Verse 3, for I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their accord begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they, gave, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So what you see here is that they had a history of giving to Paul. They gave to Paul after he left in Acts chapter 16. They gave to him when he was there in Thessalonica. This is also why I think the interpretation of Paul being there for only three Sabbaths is incorrect. Because look, money didn't come as quickly as it does now. I mean, I can send money to you just like that. It takes time. So I think Paul was there in Thessalonica longer than three Sabbaths. That's a story for another day. But I want you to turn back with me as well and look in Philippians 4.18 with me. They had this track record of giving to Paul. Paul, though, is grateful. This is what I believe is one of the triggers for the letter. But if you look in, we'll look at more of this next week. But look in verse 18. Paul is writing the letter, not entirely, I don't believe, but in large measure, or it was triggered at least through a gift that they had given. They gave to him before, they continued to, but in verse 18 of Philippians 4, But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied. He was full in the Greek. Full in prison, abounding in prison. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So I want you to think for a second. When we read this verse in verse 10, Paul was not just simply rejoicing in the Lord. He had this great joy 
that they had shown concern for him. And there's probably been about 10 years in between when he was there to establish it. And now they have, if you notice it, indeed you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. In other words, they hadn't really had a lot of opportunities to help this particular, if you will, missionary, this group. But now they had time and how, now they had the an opportunity. But you'll notice that Paul is not rejoicing simply that they got money. This isn't some Atello evangelist who is rejoicing that you sent $5 in for a cloth. Paul is grateful because it showed, notice that they had care and concern for him. Paul thought of the gift as being something that they gave to him and it showed that they had a heartfelt love and concern for him. Uh, liken it to this, we have missionaries that we support, right? Can you imagine receiving an offering from a church and they did it begrudgingly? Or, God loves a cheerful giver and the missionary thinks to themselves, wow, these people really care for me. They gave out of their bankrupt impoverishment. What a difference that would make. I can tell you as a servant of the Lord, it's nice to have something, but it's more nice to know that behind it was a care or a concern. So when we give, we need to be giving with good means. Look here, brethren, God doesn't need your money. He just wants the heart, and he wants us to give with good conscience and concern for those who are faithful servants. But Paul doesn't want them to think that he is content and his contentment is based on money. This is, again, not some sort of bankrupt in, uh, televangelist is trying to rip people off. Paul doesn't want you to think that his contentment is based off of money, off of monetary gift. Paul's going to tell you that the source of contentment is found in verses 13 through 14, but that he is a content person in prison. Look with me in verses 11 through 12 now, because you'll notice that Paul says, not that I speak from want. Paul doesn't want them to think the reason why he is so joyous is because they sent him money. Paul says that there is joy that is given to him and that he has that is based on something else. What does the word contentment mean? Well, the Greek word means, and I have it up there for those who ask for these words, it means self-sufficient, can be used that way. But you'll notice the last two, it means adequate and satisfied. That's the way in which Paul is using it here. Paul is saying that he is satisfied, he has adequate needs, and his needs are being met in jail. Isn't that amazing? That, that Paul found contentment bound in chains. I want us to look at this idea, though, of contentment. And I want you to start with me in Luke chapter 3 and verse 14. John the Baptist here deals with wages. How many of us are ever happy with how much money we have? I notice it gets really quiet whenever that comes up, right? But you'll notice that John the Baptist speaks of something, and it uses the same word here about being content, and it's being content with wages. So Luke 3.14, John the Baptist here says, Some soldiers were questioning him, saying, And what about us? What shall we do? And he, this is John the Baptist, said to them, Do not take money uh, from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely, notice, and be content with your wages. And so we see that there is this idea here, it's the same Greek word, is to be content with wages and money. Look, in other words, what John the Baptist is saying is you'll never be happy if the boss gives you a raise. A year or two later, you'll be whining, wanting more money. And then when he gives you more, you'll never be content with monetary amounts. And I don't believe the Lord ever will allow us to. You and I will never be content with money and how much we have. As a church, we could, bank, we could basically stuff the bank full with money and we would never have enough because we have to learn to be content with what we have. Now, I want you to turn, though, next. We've looked at this idea of wages. How many of us know what the basic necessities and needs are? 
Well, do you know the Bible tells us what those are? Let's turn to 1 Timothy 6. Because today you would think that fiber, internet, high-speed internet is a basic need, isn't it? Uh, an iPad and an iPhone, those are all required basic necessities to live through life. <laughs> of course, I'm kidding here. But I want us to look here and 1 Timothy chapter 6 in verses 6 through 8. And we see what the basic necessities are, the basic needs and these are things that are founding or the founding of contentment. First Timothy chapter six, verse six says, "But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it. Notice if we had food and covering, with these we shall be Greek word, same one, content." That is the basic needs of life. God will take care of providing for us the basic needs. Food and covering. Today we would say food, covering, and what? Well, unlimited data and our cell phones and all this different types of things. Isn't that true? But you'll notice what the Bible says. It says we need to be content with money. We need to be content with our wages and the basic needs of life. But now I want you to turn to Hebrews 13.5 because... It's going to, if you will, drive home this point. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. Because the author of Hebrews is going to deal with being covetousness. In other words, you can't get enough. You can't get enough wages. You're never happy with the contentment. You're never happy with the clothes that you have. You're never happy with the shoes that you have. You're never happy with the whatever you want. Notice what Hebrews 3 in verse 5 says. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is quoting Joshua 1.5. But you'll notice there, it says that your character, your inner being, uh, the type of person that you are, that you're free from, it's not money. It's the love of money. The love of money will drive churches, pastors, Christians to the brink of doing things they would never have otherwise done. If you have an in if you have a love for money, you're never going to be content because you'll never have enough. And there's a reason for that. But you'll notice there that we are told and exhorted at the end of verse 5 that God says that He is enough. God will be with us. He's not going to leave us or forsake us. We don't have to try to fill in that gap of lack of contentment because nothing can fill that gap but Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, we'll see in verses 13 and 14, that Jesus is the one who, if you will, fills that gap and He satisfies the soul. So whatever we have as a believer in Christ is enough because He satisfies the soul. And so there is no contentment outside of what God has given to us. If you want to find contentment in life and you are here today, what you're going to find is you won't find it in wages, you won't find it in materialistic things, and you won't find it in being covetousness of money. Now I want you to think today, we have a society that is largely materialistic, isn't it? I mean, look, there's Black Friday, Red Tuesday, Green Wednesday, and on and on, you know. You have all of this stuff. Man can never be satisfied with what he has. And God's saying that Christ will satisfy that gap. So if you're here today and you're trying to be satisfied in the things of this world, you understand those things aren't going to fill that void. They will never fill that void. And you say, yeah, but that's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's just saying... He's overflowing and he's abounding because life is great for him. Really? Let's go back and see now. So we know what content means. In the Greek, it has the idea, and Paul's using it as adequacy or adequate and satisfied. Now I want you to look back with me here in, in verse 12. Because what Paul's going to do is he's going to completely flip our trajectory. Our trajectory would be this. If I'm in prison, I'm in a bad state and life isn't going well. If I'm out of prison, everything should be going well, right? 
But you'll notice in the biblical text it is completely reversed. Notice what Paul says here. I know how to get along in humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of abundance and suffering need. So what is Paul describing here in verse 12? He's describing two ends of the spectrum, isn't he? So let's start here. In times of prosperity, that would mean to be abounding and filled. When did Paul just say that he and his condition was in prison? Notice verse 18. But I have received everything in full and have abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you sent. The Greek, it means he was made full by what they brought. Paul saw himself as abounding while in prison. Now, how many of us would think that? Probably not, would we? But you'll notice the other end of the spectrum. Paul says that, of course, in times of prosperity and abounding, he, he's filled and he has great joy. And most of us would say that. Whether we are in prison or whatever the case is, we would think that. But how many of us could be like Paul here and say, in times of humility... What does it mean to be, in other words, the use of the word humility? Humility means to be brought low. How many of us have ever been brought low in life? Notice what he says here, though. He says, I know how to get by with humble means. He says, I know how to be brought low. I also know what it means like to be really hungry. And I find myself content in both whether it means God is overflowing and prospering me or the reverse end of the spectrum and I'm totally, completely at my lowest point going hungry, I still am content in something that we'll see in verse 13. And you say, that just can't be right. Let's look in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 in verses 11 through 13 because I think this is really a good message for uh, America today because in America today we equate only good times to prosperity isn't that right but how as Christians if we are brought low we are doing what we, we should have the same type of attitude of joy in the Lord but I want you to turn here and I want you to see Paul describing a situation of being brought low and going into hunger and all sorts of difficult situations. But what I'm drawing out here is that in Philippians, Paul is in jail. In 1 Corinthians, he's describing himself as out of prison. But he's having a really difficult time. Let's read it. 1 Corinthians 4, 11 through 13. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty and poorly clothed and roughly treated and are homeless. That doesn't sound too good, does it? And we toil, working with our hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. In other words, console. We have become as the scum of the world and the dregs of all things, even until now. Paul saw that even during a difficult situation, times of humility, he saw that he was a servant of Jesus Christ is what he's describing there. And his contentment was found not in the things of this world, the things that most of us spend our weeks trying to find contentment in. If I just get this, if I just have this, I will find contentment in life. I want us to look at a few things here, and if you don't like getting your toes stepped on, don't listen to me for the next few minutes. But if you don't mind, I want you to start with me in Proverbs 27, 20. Because if you have a problem, you can take it up with the Lord, because He's the one who wrote this. I'm simply His messenger, and if you know me well enough, I'm going to tell you what it teaches, and pray that you will ponder it. Just consider what we're going to look at here because this is definitely not a message of when you come to Jesus Christ your bank will overflow I can already tell you that doesn't happen you may have heard on TV that coming to Christ eliminates all worry all strife that's all garbage and it doesn't come from the Word of God 
Let us look here in Proverbs 27, 20. He speaks of here the netherworld and the place of destruction. Notice, Sheol and Abaddon are never satisfied, but notice, nor are the eyes of man ever satisfied. Isn't that true? Are we ever satisfied with what we have? If you are longing for something that you have your eyes on, when you obtain it, you'll desire before too long something else, and you say, that's not true, Pastor. Well, if it's true, then every next time you get a truck, you'll love that truck, won't you? But then after a while, it starts getting a little rusty, it gets a little dirty, and then you see that next one, and you think, man, if I just have that one, I'd be satisfied. And then you get that one, and the whole cycle repeats itself. God does not want you hear me loud and clear to be satisfied or to seek satisfaction outside of Christ Jesus because he knows you won't find it. Now let's go on here and let's look in Ecclesiastes because Ecclesiastes is going to really pop our bubbles if we listen to this because modern preaching says that when you're going along and doing what God says, everything will be rosy. And if you're not, then... You're something wrong with you. So could good and bad situations come from God? What does the Bible say? Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 14. In the, ha in the day of prosperity be happy. But you notice that the verse isn't over yet. But in the day of adversity consider God has made the one as well as the other. God brings both into our lives, doesn't he? Uh, on the day when you have prosperity, I would hope that your thought would be, praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day, or whatever the circumstances. But what about the reverse? If God brings both, we are to rejoice in both, aren't we? God is working all things to the good for his glory, isn't he? Why does God allow good and bad at the same time? Sometimes we don't know. That's what the book of Job teaches us. Sometimes we have no what's ha any idea what's going on in the heavenly realm. And so we see that we are never going to be satisfied, Proverbs 27, in things of this life. God sends the good and the bad on our lives. But I want us now to look at James chapter 1 and verse 17. James chapter 1 and verse 17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In other words, God doesn't change His nature. He's always who He is. He is I Am. Anything that you ever receive it's ultimately from the Lord. When you receive those good things from the Lord, you need to remember they don't come from anyone else than the hand of Almighty God. And we should praise Him, shouldn't we? Whether we are in good times or bad, we are called, we see in Ecclesiastes, but ultimately all the good comes from the Lord. Anything you have, beloved, does not come from anyone else but God Himself. He gives us all the good, doesn't He? Rejoice and rejoice in the Lord. Now, if that's true, then how does Paul get himself out of the quandary that he's in prison and he says that there is a source of contentment. It can't be bought. It's not materialistic. It can't come from anywhere on this earth. In other words, if you notice, all the things that I've described are essentially external things. And all the external things, beloved, whether you like hearing this or not, these are the things that we typically look to be satisfied is in the external. But Paul bursts the bubble and says that isn't the source and the place of contentment. It is in verse 13. Notice what he says. He gives you the answer of how in prison, in a horrible situation, he is able to do and endure what he does. Notice what he says, one of the most misused, abused, butchered, butchered verses in Scripture. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You know, what does this mean versus what we typically think? I'm sorry to break the news to you. This does not mean by my own willpower and whatever plans I have that God's going to bless every single one of them. What does this passage really teach is the question. 
because it gets misused and abused up, down, left, and right. Well, you'll notice Paul says, I can do all things. What's the all things? Well, contextually, it demands that it's all the good and the bad. This totally blows most of our minds because most of the time when this is used, it is used as a bumper sticker because they want to determine what their life is and they want God to bless it. That is not what the passage teaches. It says that what? Verse 12, the context demands exactly what we just said. What is the all? It's the all is the good and bad. Notice I know how to get along in humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret, that's the key, of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. What is the source? What is the key? The answer to the question is Christ Jesus our Lord. He is the source. He is the one that enabled Paul to endure all the sufferings of ministry. He's the one who enabled him to go in to be in prison and rejoice. It was completely internal and it was void of all the external in life. Paul could endure the good and the bad because of what he had in Christ Jesus. The source of his joy was Christ. That's totally different than what we think, right? We think that this is a positive verse and God strengthens me to do anything that I want. Beloved, don't go running and jump off the top of a building because Christ won't give you the strength to fly. That is not what the passage is teaching. How many of you know that in history, in this point in time, there was a group of individuals that were called Stoics? Now, this isn't someone who is Stoic in a mean they don't have much expression. Uh, that, that's a whole other use of the words. But Stoics of Paul's day, they taught what was called self-sufficiency. You know what that was? They wanted to remove any source of external sufficiency, and their sufficiency was themselves. They were sufficient in their own self, in their own means, in their own ways. What Paul is teaching is diametrically different. Paul is teaching Christ's sufficiency. He's not teaching the sufficiency of the Stoics, which with you and within yourself, you can do whatever you want. No, Paul says that Christ is the one who makes you sufficient. Christ gives you the sufficiency. This is not self-help. Do you understand? This is the Lord's help. The Lord is the only one who can help us. You cannot buckle up, pick up your bootstraps, tighten your belt, and bring yourself and drag yourself into salvation. You cannot endure all the difficulties in life on your own, can you? The Stoics of Paul's day said you are sufficient on your own. And Paul says, no, it is a Christ sufficiency and Christ alone. I found it interesting that, and I had no idea that uh, Lindsay was using what she did because I had in here Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his own sake. In other words, for his own glory. God does everything ultimately for his own glory. But you'll notice here that the psalmist, Psalm David, is saying in Psalm 23 that he's not in need, he's not in want. Why? Because thou art with me. Thou will never leave me nor forsake me. The source of all joy is Jesus Christ, crucified, resurrected, seated at the right hand of the Father, come in power and glory. It is not going to be found in the externals of this life. If you are expecting me to get up here and tell you that you can find satisfaction outside of Christ, it ain't going to happen. You will never be satisfied. Hear me loud and clear to our young folks. You will never be satisfied in the things that the world has to offer you. The only satisfaction you will ever have is Jesus Christ alone. But notice verse 14. Paul doesn't want to be rude. Notice. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me and my affliction. What is Paul saying here? Paul doesn't want them to think he's not appreciative of the gift, does he? Understand, Paul starts with saying, look, I'm grateful for the gift. It was a sacrificial gift and God was pleased with it. But I'm not satisfied and content in prison because you gave me money. 
My satisfaction is in Jesus Christ alone. Dead, buried, coming in the power of glory. But I also appreciate the gift. Do you understand the dichotomy there? He says, I'm thankful for the gift. If someone ever gives you a gift, what is the obvious application? Thank you. I don't need it, maybe, but I appreciate it nevertheless. Let me ask you this. Are you content with life and the things of this life? Are you looking for contentment in this world? Do you always need new, shiny, bright toys? Do you need A and you want B? You have B and you want A. You will not find satisfaction, beloved, outside of this key of source of salvation, which is Jesus Christ. There is this beautiful hymn that I ran across. It's more of a poem. It says, All my life I had a longing for a drink from some clear spring that I hoped would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within. Hallelujah! I have found him who my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings through his blood. Now I am saved. If you're here today and you are not content in life, you need to start at the foot of the cross because that is the beginning and that is the source of all contentment until he comes. Beloved, don't look to the world for help and the source of contentment because you won't find it. Father, we thank you for today. And Lord, we thank you for giving us the hard truth sometimes of your word, Lord, in our state that we are in, yes, having trusted in Christ for salvation. But Lord, we so often think that, well, if we just have this, if we just have that, we look for the source of contentment in everything sometimes, but where it is obvious, which is the contentment of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that we look to the good and the bad situations in life, Lord. And Lord, it's easy when things are going well to say, yes, the Lord is with me to strengthen me. But what about during the difficult days? Lord, we see here that the Lord wants to help us in the times of abundance, but also in the times of need and want, because He alone is the one that satisfies the soul. Father, again, we thank You today, and now may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to each person that is here today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.